Greetings and welcome to the lecture on bacterial genomes. This lecture has been introduced into your course on molecular biology techniques too, in order to familiarize you with the concept of bacterial genomes. Now, bacteria are used as model organisms in molecular biology. They can be utilized for conducting gene knockout experiments as well as for the expression of proteins or recombinant genes. And they have found application in molecular biology as model organisms. Now, in this lecture, we will be exploring the role of bacterial genomics and genome sequencing. The objectives of this particular lecture are to introduce you to the concept of bacterial genome sequencing in terms of the experimental design, to introduce you to the concept of bacterial genome assembly and annotation pipeline, and to transfer analytical skills pertaining to interpretation of bacterial genomic data. What this particular lecture aims to achieve with respect to learning is as follows. Firstly, you will be introduced to you to the concept of bacterial genome sequencing and the manner in which this is conducted in terms of experimental design. We will explore the procedure in a step-by-step -step manner. Subsequent to bacterial genome sequencing, we have to proceed into what is known as genome assembly and annotation. So I will introduce you to the basic pipeline. And the final step in this lecture, which you will conduct in the bioinformatics facility or on your personal bioinformatics platform, is the process of conducting the entire experiment from assembly to annotation in terms of the bioinformatics. The learning outcomes of this particular lecture as follows. Upon completion of this module, you should demonstrate these following abilities. You should be able to design an experiment to sequence the genome of a bacterium, design and describe the pipeline in involved in genome assembly annotation and comparative genomics, and analyze genomic features in terms of their biological context. So what this basically means is that when we commence genome sequencing, we set up what is known as an experimental design. And this experimental design defines, for instance, the concentration and purity of the DNA, which ne is needed for the experiment. It then moves on to what is known as the genome assembly pipeline. So this pipeline involves the sequencing of the bacterium itself, the isolation of specific reads based on quality scores, and finally, the assembly of these quality reads or these reads in terms of the Q ratios or the Q scores. We then proceed to what is known as comparative genomics, which involves the comparison of our genome assembly with others available at the NCBI gene bank. And finally, we have to do the analysis of genomic features in terms of their biological context. This means we compare our assembled genome with those available at the NCBI gene bank. These are the content of this lecture, and I will describe them in detail. The first concept which you have to understand is the manner in which the bacterial genome is organized. An organization refers to the distribution of the genomic information within a bacterial genome. In general, bacteria comprise a circular genome along with a linear genome as well, and maybe a set of plasmids. And each bacterium has a unique genome organization. For instance, 
agrobacterium tumor patients has a linear genome in terms of a plasmid, a circular genome as well as virulence plasmids. The next step for the next content in this particular lecture is the experimental design for genome sequencing projects. I will describe the process of experimental design. We will then move on to library preparation, processing genome sequence data, analysis using specific tools, and one of the most useful tools, which is the rapid annotation using subsystem technology or the RAS tool. And finally, we move on to the in vitro validation of assembly. So as you can see, microbial genome sequencing involves multiple steps. You first have to extract the DNA from the bacterium, and this DNA must be sufficiently pure as well as free from other contaminants. It is very important that your bacterial genome sequence or the bacterial DNA be free of contaminants. <clears throat> and for this reason, you need to have what is known as an exanic or a pure culture. The pipeline for the experiment design refers to the bioinformatics tools which you will be utilizing to sequence your genome and to analyze the information. And finally, you have to annotate your genome. Annotation refers to the procedure of identifying genes or other genetic elements or genomic features by using specific tools. In general, the genome consists of RNA as well as protein coding regions. And there may be elements such as CRISPRs, which are involved in bacterial host defense. Finally, the step pertaining to validation of assembly involves the use of the polymerase chain reaction in order to validate what you have done in terms of the bioinformatics. What you should remember is that bioinformatics is a statistical process and the assembled genome may have certain inconsistencies when compared to the gold standard or the true genome. Let us begin with the first step, which is genome organization. Now, bacterial genomes are organized in terms of their basically the manner in which the genome is organized is the circular chromosome. We have plasmid DNA and we have linear chromosomes. Now, all of these features are visible in a bacterial genome. I will briefly draw it, to, draw it for you so that you can understand the concepts. So when we have a bacterium, a bacterium consists of a cell wall and a membrane, and within this are enclosed the genomes. So the bacterial genome is organized along a circular chromosome. Now, bacteria do not have a specific container for this particular genome. There is no nuclear envelope. So the genome resides as a circular entity within the bacterium itself. There may be linear chromosomes, and these linear chromosomes may be present in single or double copies within the genome. And finally, you have the circular chromosome, which is the plasmid. So the plasmid is basically a self-replicating unit which exists independently of the main genome. So this is the basic organization. However, not all bacteria will contain all of these elements, but they will contain the single circular large chromosome. The plasmid may be present in multiple copies, and there may be multiple types of plasmids. And these plasmids are generally associated with certain characteristics such as antibiotic resistance. Uh, then you have the degradation of steroids, for instance, which are harmful for bacteria, as well as metal tolerance. And plasmids are acquired 
by the process of horizontal gene transfer. So these plasmids, such as resistance plasmids, may be acquired from other bacterial species which are residing in the environment. So there can be a transfer of plasmids. So you have a secondary bacterium. It can transfer its plasmid into a bacterium which is, is in close proximity with. And these plasmids, in turn, can be transferred across bacterial species. And this process is known as horizontal gene transfer. Now, when you analyze a genome and you want to sequence a genome, you must be aware of the different elements of the bacterium which is or which are present in a particular individual. So what we generally do in the laboratory is we prepare what is known as an exenic culture. We will isolate a bacterium and we will purify it and obtain a single colony on a plate. And at this stage, we then increase the copy number of the bacterium using liquid culture media, following which we purify and extract the plasmid DNA as well as the genomic DNA. As you may be aware, and you, as you have learned in Molecular Biology Techniques 1, plasmid extraction is done using the alkaline lysis mini prep and genomic DNA extraction is done using conventional genome extraction methods. So when you run your gel, or basically when you resolve your DNA on the gel, you will see, for instance, when you have your DNA, you will see a single band at the top of the gel. So this is from DNA extraction. And when you run your plasmid DNA, you will see three distinct bands. So these represent the different states of the plasmid, which are the linear state, the mixed circular, and the supercoiled state of the plasmid. So when you have these kind of features, when you do this uh, gel resolution and you have these two features, you know that there will there is a, at least one plasmid. And of course, you have the DNA, which is sufficiently pure. So this is basically the genome organization of the bacterium. So before you proceed to microbial genome sequencing, you must be aware of the features present in your bacterial genome. You can also look up these features using the NCPI gene bank as a reference. So now uh, we move on to the ribosomal RNA. So ribosomal RNAs can be utilized to validate your sequence integrity. As you know, the bacterial genome consists of ribosomal RNAs. And these ribosomal RNAs are present universally. And upon completion of your genome sequencing, we generally use a tool such as RNA-mer to look for these microbial RNAs. And if your RNA is present in your final genome assembly, you can be certain that your genome has been sequenced to completion. OK, so this is the question which we generally ask during the course of this lecture is, how can you apply RNA prediction to validate the integrity of your genome sequence data? So what we do is, upon completion of the genome sequencing assembly, we run this particular software, which is RNA-mer, and we can predict the number of the RNAs within our genome. And this gives you an idea of your genome completeness. For instance, if your RNAs are not according to what is predicted based on other genomes which are complete, then you may have to relook into your genome sequencing data and resequence your bacterial genome. Another aspect which we look at is gene, gene sequences in terms of the biochemical pathway. Now, when we are sequencing a genome, we are interested in knowing about that bacterium. For instance, if you have isolated a bacterium for the production of a specific metabolite, 
you may have to look into the genome sequence and then look at biochemical pathways associated with this particular metabolite. Now, if you identify, for instance, a metabolic pathway in a bacterium, you can actually isolate this entire cluster of genes and transfer them into another bacterium, such as Escherichia coli, and upscale these for the industrial production of that particular metabolite. So these are ways in which you can utilize the microbial genome for downstream applications in biotechnology. You can also conduct what is known as prediction based on the presence of a gene or a set of genes associated with a specific pathway. What this means is that if you identify genes, for instance, related to the production of certain biochemical compounds or certain antibiotics, you can then predict the presence of genes or a set of genes associated with the pathway. Let me look, for instance, at an example of a bacterium which is producing an antimicrobial peptide or an antimicrobial compound. So if the bacterium is producing this particular compound, I can sequence the genome and look back at the genes involved in that particular antimicrobial compound. And this is important in, in terms of the biotechnology. Now, the absence of a single gene in a pathway does not imply that the pathway is non-functional. Generally, when we sequence our genomes, we compare the genome with other genomes, and we look for genes in a pathway. Now, a pathway may comprise of more than one gene. And the absence of one gene does not imply that the pathway is non-functional because there may be genes in the microbial genome which will basically complement the genetic pathway. We can also look at the functionality of enzymes. And there are many enzymes in bacteria which have been cloned and sequenced in E. coli and used for industrial purposes. And there are also some functions which may be unknown at the present time. This means when you do genome sequencing and you compare them with existing genes with known functions, some of the functionality may not be predictable because these genes have not been reported earlier. There are other genomic features which we can look at in detail. For instance, there are what is known as genomic islands, and these are generally found in microbials with our pathogens. And these genomic islands are present in the genome, and they consist of multiple sets of genes. For instance, if you look through a graphical depiction, you'll find multiple genes associated with the pathogenicity. And this can be related to the production of toxins. So you'll have a cluster of genes, and these genes may be related to the production of toxins, as well as the transport of these toxins. Okay, now, these are genomic features, and they are termed as genomic islands associated with pathogenicity. We also look at secretion systems, and this is also of the relevance in terms of the medical microbiology. So bacteria have what are known as secretion systems, type 1, type 2 secretion systems. And these secretion systems are involved in the transport of toxins from inside the cell into the outer space. And if you have enteric pathogens, or pathogens which inhabit your gut, the presence of secretion systems may be related to their toxicity. We also look at CRISPR. And these elements are involved in the defense, microbial host defense, against bacteriophages. And we look at what are termed as recombination sites within the genome in case you want to conduct a genome insertion experiment. Okay, a recombination site is a site within the genome. For example, you have your bacterial genome. There may be sites where a plasmid can integrate. So these are called recombination sites. So once the plasmid recombines with the genome, the plasmid material is transferred into the genome itself. Let us move into the first section, which is the experimental design or the essential steps involved in 
ensuring genome completeness. Now, what is very important to note is that once you conduct your genome sequencing experiment, your genome must be complete. So in order to ensure genomic completeness, we have to adopt or implement the following steps. Let us look at the basic experiment design for NGS. For instance, a bacterium has a genome size of 4.5 megabases. Now, how do you know this? We simply look through the NCBI gene bank, where you have thousands of genomes. For instance, if I have Pseudomonas arginosa, I've looked through the NCBI gene bank and find the approximate genome size based on the experimental data and the genome sequences available. Now, at the NCBI gene bank, you may also find what are known as gold standards. These are microbial genomes which have been sequenced using multiple platforms and they comprise of both long reads and short reads which are assembled together and these genomes are very accurate or precise. Okay, so assuming that you have a microbial genome size of 4.5 megabases and your sequencing platform which we generally use for small genomes is the Illumina HiSeq or the NextSec E150 which sequences the genomes in terms of 150 bases. We can compute the number of reads, assuming that we have a genome size or a genome coverage of 150 times. So when we use a Illumina sequencing platform with a paired end 150, we basically multiply this 150 with the number of megabases, and we assume that 20% of the reads will not achieve what is known as the quality score of Q30. So when we compute all these, we can basically multiply 4.5 megabases by 150, okay, and then we add an additional 20%. Now, you should conduct this exercise <clears throat> as a part of your learning process. So multiply 4.5 megabases with 150 times, you multiply it by 150, and you add 20% of the reads. And the number which you obtain will be basically the data output which you must request from your service provider. Or when you conduct your sequencing, you must obtain that particular data output. Now the library, the word library pertains to what is known as the sequencing library. Now just as you have books in a library, the books are located on shelves in the library. When we look at genome sequencing, we consider the genome in itself as a library. So the DNA has a library. Now in order to read the library, you cannot read the entire library in one go. You have to read individual books and reading a genome sequence is analogous to reading books in the library. So you have your entire genome, and then you have books, which are segments of the genome. And you do not read the entire genome in one go. You read it in terms of the books. So you read each segment separately. Now, based on the platform which you have, the library preparations procedures will be different. For instance, if you're using a long read platform, such as a PacPio, you will have to prepare the genome for long reads. So in the case of PacBio, you can read extremely large sections of the genome. So generally, we shear this to the size of around 10,000 bases to 20,000 bases based on the library preparation protocol. However, if you use Illumina, which is using a paired and read, your genome size or the fragment size is generally smaller. So PacBio can basically read long fragments of the genome as in this case, and in the case of the Illumina, we use smaller reads. Whichever read you use or read, uh, whichever library preparation procedure you use, you must refer to the manufacturer's manual as the steps are different. Now, for the purpose of generalization, the steps in library preparation are the DNA QC or the quality control, we basically use instrumentation to 
determine the purity and the concentration of the DNA. So this is quality control. We then move on to DNA shearing or physically cutting the DNA into smaller sizes by using different procedures such as enzymatic digestion or the shearing using what is known as a covaris tube system. We then ligate what are known as adapters. We proceed to library quality control. So we after we adapt, we have these ligators adapted to the ends. We move on to the library quality control. And finally, we proceed to sequencing. Now, all of these steps are done in the lab laboratory or in a wet laboratory. And they involve manipulation of the DNA. So you first extract your DNA. You carry out the QC. You obtain a sufficient concentration. Generally, we require 20,000 nanograms of DNA for an Illumina experiment. We then move on to DNA shearing, adapter ligation, library quality control, and sequencing itself on the sequencer or the sequencing platform. We will go through this step by step during the course of this particular lecture. We then move on to genome assembly and annotation, which is the software that is used to assemble, annotate, and interpret genomic information. So when you commence with your genomic sequencing, we will basically grow through the procedure. So you have your genome, which is a large circular chromosome. You will extract this genome and generally require 20,000 nanograms of DNA. So you may have to do multiple preps in order to isolate this DNA. Subsequent to that, the genome has to be sheared. So what is done during shearing is that an enzyme is used to cut this genome. So you'll, the genome is fragmented into smaller fragments. Now, if we are using Illumina systems, we can use a preparation kit we have an Xterra preparation kit. This kit will cut the genome into sizes of approximately 200 to 300 bases. Now, when you resolve these cut fragments on a gel, what you will see is a thick band between 200 to 300 bases. And your genome will be basically, for example, this is the intact DNA. After sharing, you will see a band at around 200 to 300 bases. And this will be your sheared DNA. DNA can also be sheared using physical procedures, such as centrifugation or pipetting up and down through a pipette. However, this is not recommended, as the DNA size will be uneven. Now, after you obtain this particular fragment, you have smaller fragments, which are basically in the range of 200 to 300 bases. So this is how it will look. This is the 3 prime end. And this is the 5 prime end. Now, you cannot sequence this directly, as there will be no way to assemble this together. So once you basically break up your DNA, it's like opening up a jigsaw puzzle box and messing it up. So you basically cannot obtain, or you cannot know the fragments. For instance, you have your jigsaw puzzle, and you have this fragment. You have to find a fragment which fits into this particular puzzle. So you have to have a fragment which will be something like this, or else you will not be able to assemble the puzzle. Now, in the case of the DNA, in order to identify each fragment, we adapt, we fit what are known as adapters. Now, these adapters sit at both the 3 prime and 5 prime end. And these adapters consist of a known sequence. We will explore this during your bioinformatics session in the bioinformatics laboratory. So these may consist of specific fragments. And these are supplied by the manufacturer. Now, after you complete your genome sequencing procedure, or when you want to assemble your genome, these adapters can be identified by the software. And they are basically like flags, just as you have your puzzle and you have your indentations in the puzzle. This particular fragments can be assembled later based on the adapter sequence. 
And if you do multiple genome sequencing, if you run two genomes during the same sequencing procedure, you can you can basically label them with different kinds of tags, and you can run more than one genome sequence during one genomic sequencing procedure. And this saves you time and money. OK, so once you have obtained your sequence from the sequencer, the sequencing data is in the form of what are known as the raw reads. OK, so you have these raw reads. Raw reads are basically sequences with an approximate size of 200 bases, right up to 10,000 bases in the case of PacBio. So generally, an Illumina sequencing read will be around 200 bases. And if you have your PacBio, Pacific Biosciences, you will get a very large read of maybe 10,000 bases or maybe even 20,000 bases based on the library preparation. The first step involves the removal of the adapters. So this adapter is removed in silico or by the software, bioinformatics software. And generally, we use a software known as Trimomatic. We have to specify the adapter sequence. And this software will basically remove the adapters from the two ends. Okay, we also move on to the assembly of the reads using a sequencing assembler. So we use Celera, or Velvet, or Spades. Generally, this pipeline is set up in our laboratory using the CLC biology workbench. So all you need to do is introduce your raw reads or transfer your raw reads using a pen drive. So you transfer your raw reads. The software will proceed to filter the reads, remove the adapters, and assemble the reads. This is the first part, which is basically obtaining your genome sequence. The next part involves the annotation of the sequence. Annotation refers to the procedure of identifying genomic features. So what we do is we scan for the open reading frames, which encode genes, as well as coding regions and non-coding regions. We validate the completion of the genome assembly using rna mer which is a software to determine the copy number of the RNAs within the genome. And then we proceed to similar similarity searches using the basic local alignment search tool, or BLAST10. And we do some graphical representation. In cases where you want to publish your genome in a laboratory report or within a particular manuscript. And then we move on to specific feature identification using the software such as the RAST, which is the rapid annotation using software technology, systems technology, subsystems technology. So this is a software which is known as RAST, where R is the rapid annotation using subsystems technology. And this is a very comprehensive software, which can be utilized by newcomers in the field of bioinformatics. We also have the graphical representation in terms of the blast ring image generator, or BRIG. We can look for CRISPR using CRISPR Finder. We have the antibiotic resistance clusters using anti-SMASH and the Kyoto Encyclopedia for genes and genomes for the identification of pathways. So these are multiple softwares or bioinformatics platforms which you can utilize for genomic features and the identification. Now, when you conduct a genome sequencing experiment, the data analysis, as you have seen, has multiple approaches. And at the end of the day, the data analysis depends on what you want to identify within that particular genome. So the first question which you generally pose to yourself is, what do you want to discover? Are you interested in discovering antibiotic resistance pathways? Are you interested in discovering metal tolerance pathways? Or are you interested in other features related to the application or the downstream application of that bacterium? Okay. The next step is asking yourself this question. Do you want to utilize the data, apply the data to corroborate phenotypical characteristics? A very simple example is your bacterium is producing an antimicrobial compound. And you want to identify whether this 
particular characteristic of the bacterium is represented in the gene. So you corroborate this data by genome sequencing and you validate this. If you want to discover new genes, you follow a different approach as new genes may not have their analogs in the genome sequence. So you may not, you, when you, for instance, you want to discover new genes, you compare your genome with the NCBI. The NCBI genome will only have known genes. So your genes will be beyond the scope of this particular process. So in that case, you have to look at the unknown genes or the genes which could not be mapped back to the NCBI genome. Most of the research focuses on understanding the basis for pathogenesis as it involves medically relevant microbes. And this involves another procedure using, for instance, the detection of pathogenicity islands or software such as anti-smash or antimicrobial resistance pathways. If you want to utilize the microbe for downstream application, such as production of a particular metabolite in the biotechnology industry, via fermentation, you can look at the requirements of that microbial, microbial organism for the production of a downstream products, such as, for instance, an antimicrobial compound. And this is very important because when you culture your bacterium in a bioreactor, you, know, you need to know precisely what are the nutritional requirements so if you identify the genes via genome sequencing, for instance, for carbohydrate metabolism or lipid biosynthesis, you can provide the appropriate raw material in the bioreactor for the production of that particular compound. And finally, we look at linkage studies. For instance, you want to compare your bacterium with other bacteria of the same type to find variants or linkages between bacterium so in that case, you do what are known as linkage studies. So these are the different criteria which you must specify prior to conducting a genome sequencing experiment. So the first step in genome assembly involves the read quality. So we have what is known as the fast QC tool. It's a quality control tool. And generally, we select the reads based on what is known as the quality score or the Q score. And the cutoff for the good quality assembly is Q30, or 1 in 1,000 error rate. So you have 1,000 basis. For every 1,000 basis, you have an error rate of 1. If it is Q20, it implies that you have 1 in 100. Okay. So generally, we go in for a cutoff of Q30, obtain a very good assembly. If you go in for Q20, you will get an assembly, however, there will be high error rate. So generally, it's recommended that you go for Q30 and above. Okay, this is a typical graph. As you can see, the sequencing quality has dropped. So this shows you the different qualities of the reads which are obtained from the Illumina sequencer. OK, so this is the quality, high quality. And you have this. And as the sequencing pr proceeded, you will notice the quality dropped. Now, in Illumina sequencers, this generally happens because this is the read. So the read is paired end, which means that the genomic sequence is read by the sequencer from both ends. And the sequence data is obtained. So as the uh, sequencing procedure, or what is known as cycle sequencing, progresses, the chemical or the compounds which are utilized in the machine get exhausted. So at the end of the cycle, usually at the end of the cycling procedure, the reads will be bad. So the first reads, for instance, when you begin your procedure, the first reads are very good. The entire fragment is read through. However, as the sequencing progresses, the read size will become smaller and smaller. There will be reads, however, there will be a high error rate. So generally, we want to reject these particular reads as they create problems during assembly and filter out these reads. Now, fast QC will help you to filter out these particular reads. Okay, so these reads are all here, and these reads are here. These ones are basically here. So, fast QC. So, this is an automated procedure. All you need to do is transfer your sequence data from the sequencer into fast QC, and the fast QC will basically 
identify the reads and filter them out into two what are known as bins. Yes, okay, so we'll have this is a good quality read. Okay, so everything is up here, and this is bad quality read. So you have a mixture of reads. So when you do a fast QC experiments, you can filter out and discard these reads, and you can retain the reads which are of good quality here. Okay, so this is the procedure which you need to follow. However, if you have too much of bad quality reads, for instance, this one shifts this way, you'll have too many reads. You have to resequence the genome as the reads are basically unusable. Okay, so this is what happens during a genome sequencing experiment using, and then followed by FASTQC, we see the skew in what is known as the G to C ratio which is an indication of a bad output. Okay, so that shows you whether your output is good or bad. So you have an even distribution of reads. It means that your GC ratio is ideal and your output is good. However, if you have skewed ratios, which are basically indicating like a staggered, you can see the staggered procedure, the curve is not smooth. So this indicates that there are some anomalies in your genome sequencing and some of the reads have not been truly read or covered by that particular sequencing experiment. So this may be an indication of an improper library prep or a problem with your chemistry for your DNA sequencing platform. Okay, so adapter removal, as I mentioned to you, refers to the removal of the ends of the sequences, which you have basically put into them to identify the genomic sequence information. And in this case, we use uh, software known as Trimomatic, which virtually removes these adapters. So the Trimomatic software is an in silico tool, so it will remove these sequences in silico as the sequence information is known. And what is obtained from this particular procedure is the raw read itself. So you obtain this raw read with which you then assemble the whole genome. Now you can assess the sequence for contamination using a tool which is known as Kraken. And what does contamination in bacterial genome sequencing actually refer to? Sometimes when you isolate bacteria on a plate and then you reculture them and you reculture them, there is a high likelihood of contamination. This is because symbiotic bacteria may be associated with your particular bacterial genome. And in this case, we have to assess for what is known as contamination. And a software known as Kraken, you introduce your genome, assemble genome or your reads into that particular software. Kraken will identify whether there is a microbial contaminant based on the 16S ribosomal RNA. Okay. And it produces what is known as a Krona plot. And a link to the software is given in your slides below. Okay, this is what a Kraken output will look like. So it will give you the spectrum of contamination in a particular sample. Ideally, you should only have one microbial genome when you sequence a pure or an exanic culture. So if you have too much of these indentations in your graph, if you have sectoring of the graph, it implies that you have contamination from other microbial genomes or even eukaryotic genomes. Okay. Following this, we proceed to what is known as Assembly, so assembly refers to the, so you have small fragments, you need to assemble these. So we use what is known as a KMR system. So the KMRs are basically a concept in which you break down your general sequence into formers. So if I said former, it refers to me breaking down the sequence into the formers. So you have four and four, or even you can use this. So you have this and then you have this, so you have formers. So you break down the sequence into smaller fragments, which are known as formers. So please remember that as you increase the size, for instance, you have six mers, you have uh, basically to utilize more processing power in the software as it has to do multiple comparisons. So what a genome sequence or a genome assembler does is basically after you give it the raw reads, from the sequencer, the assembler will basically look for common fragments in this particular genome. It'll look for commonality, okay? And then it will assemble this genome based on the common regions of this genome. And it will create what is known as a contig, okay, based on these assemblies. 
okay this is a procedure known as the de novo assembly de novo means you do not refer to another genome and this has to be done when your genome is unique or novel but if you have a genome which already exists at the ncbi gene bank we can use what is known as a assembly against the reference so in this case i will show you what happens so let us assume that you have a genome available at the ncbi gene bank for example you have pseudomonas aeruginosa e coli so you have your raw reads so you obtain your reads from the sequencer and you basically map these reads to that particular genome so you can map them so you have a read for instance you have a read which is 150 basis and this maps to this segment of the genome you have under read and it maps here so in this way you use uh, existing genome to assemble your particular fragments now this may not be possible in most cases as genomes contain regions which are unique and you may have certain fragments which do not map against that genome in that case you need to do an assembly using a de novo approach however this approach in which you use a mapping against reads is ideal as you have a reference and you can identify if your genome sequence is incomplete or complete okay so now we have different kinds of software if you are using illumina reads you can utilize the online platform and use something known as pages for assembly so illumina has an app you can access it online it's called the base space app and you can basically transfer your data from your sequence data into the base space app and utilize spades for assembly and spades has multiple settings and so very ideal tool for people with no prior information of high informatics so reads obtained from what is known as illum uh, from the single molecular real time smrt sequencer such as the pack bio sequencing platforms can be assembled using their own software which is the in house software which is called hcap okay, so it's based on another software known as celera so each uh, manufacturer or the genome sequencing system has its own specific assembly okay so there are some of the most widely used assemblers which are velvet abyss and soap de novo Okay, these are also used, but however, you to, in order to use this, you require a knowledge of bioinformatics. So, when we obtain our sequencing output, the end product, it can be a single contig, which is a complete genome, or it can be in the form of multiple contigs. Generally, when you use um, de novo assembly, you will obtain more than one contig, as the sequencing capacity of small read sequencers such as illumina pad and sequencing does not allow you to assemble the whole genome you may have to use what is known as a hybrid assembly which involves two sets of data one from a smrt sequencer and one from a illumina sequencer so with smrt you get a large sequence and with the illumina you get small accurate sequence so in this way you utilize what is known as hybrid sequencing to utilize two sequencing outputs to generate your complete genome okay for example i have shown you the presence of plasmids so if your sequence consists of plasmids then you will have more than one contig so you'll have your main contig which will be large and you have your plasmid contigs which are smaller you can validate all of these contigs by doing a basic local alignment search against the standard genomes okay validation of genome assembly can be done in silico as i mentioned earlier once you assemble the sequencer you can utilize what is known as the basic local alignment search tool or blast n to compare it with known genomes at the gene bank or you can also use an in vitro approach which involves the selection of a random region of the contig for validation using pcr you have already learned about um, sequence analysis using blast and you will have also learned in molecular biology techniques 1 about primer design so what we have is our assembled fragment we generally design a primer pair on certain regions of the genome and then we synthesize these primers and we conduct a pcr to determine the validity of our assembled contig the open reading frames which are relevant in terms of the discovery of genes is done using a 
software known as GeneMax. All you have to do is transfer your completed genome to GeneMax. And once you have your completed genome, the GeneMax will basically scan through the genome. So what uh, GeneMax does, it looks for start codons in the form of ATG or equivalent. And then it basically looks for the ORF associated with that ATG. And it looks for also for the stop codon. So you have your start and stop codon. And GeneMax is basically looking for the sequences associated with So it looks for these, and it will divide it by three in order to obtain the amino acid sequence and the relevant codon sequence. And once you have these particular scanned elements, it will compare them and look for basically the open reading frames. OK, so they have the identification of the start codon followed by identification of the ORFs. OK, and these ORFs can be compared by using the basic local alignment search tool for protein against all available amino acid sequences. CRISPR is another tool. So you have CRISPR finder. So CRISPR looks for the palindromic sequences and the gaps. So a CRISPR sequence basically looks like this. So you'll have your sequence. So this is the repeat region. So there'll be repeat regions in the sequence. Okay, so these are the repeat regions within your assembled sequence. And this is the region which is derived from the phage to the external DNA. So this CRISPR finder will basically look for the repeat region. And it will look for the phage DNA within the repeat region and identify the phage elements which have been incorporated into the bacterial genome as part of the host defense and immunity. You can also use something known as spoligotyping for identifying the mycobacterium tuberculosis strains. This is generally used in the identification of the variants of mycobacterium tuberculosis by medical microbiologists. Now, Blast Koala and Ghost Koala are both annotation servers which will basically compare your genome and look for genes associated with pathways based on the KEG, or the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes Orthology. Okay, so what it means is that when you have your genome and you identified specific genes within the genome, the KEG, it can be basically utilized to link these genes to a specific pathway. So there are biosynthetic pathways within every genome. And these genes can be assigned to this particular pathway. In that way, you know what your microbial genome is actually attributed to in terms of production of the biosynthetic compound. For example, you have the non-ribosomal peptide biosynthesis pathway, which is based on polyketide synthase. So if you had these particular genes associated with that particular pathway, you will know that that pathway exists in your bacterium. So this is what you look at, or what you obtain when you run uh, pathway analysis. And it will identify all the genes associated with a specific biochemical pathway. Now, a dot plot is another very common comparative analysis, which is done when you have microbial genome sequencing. What a dot plot is a uh, comparison between uh, your genome versus a known genome or your genome versus another genome which you may have sequenced earlier. Now, a dot plot is a comparison of the similarity between the two genomes. So what we see is basically a dot plot. So if you have a linear part, it means that A and B share a common elements or common genetic features at this particular location. However, if you have something like this or something like this, it indicates a genomic discontinuity. OK, so you have a discontinuity which indicates a region where there's a gene polymorphism or a genomic element has integrated. Okay, so you can use software such as the RAST, rapid annotation using subsystem technology to generate a dot plot. Okay, this is what a dot plot looks like. So as you can see, there are certain regions which are not contiguous, there are breaks. So this may be indications of differences or inconsistencies in the genome or even recombination events. And some of the dots, as you can see, observed here are distributed across. And these are 
present only in this genome and these are present only in this genome. So this is a comparison of one genome with another genome. So you have Bacillus cereus, ATCC, with a Bacillus cereus, which is assembled by you. There are different softwares, however, they are more in terms of the display or the depiction of the genome. So you have the Brig, a blast ring image generator, you have MOV and Vista. All of these software are utilized for comparison of genomes and a graphic representation. They only provide you with a more visible interpretation of the genome and they are related to the graphic interpretation. This is a Brig. So this is a blast ring image generator. You can compare more than one genome, and it will show you the genome as a circular element with the comparatives in terms of the genes and the other elements. Okay, so you have your GC ratio, you have the genes, and you have the ORFs. This is an output generated by another software, so you can see the comparison of the genome. However, this should not uh, basically concern you in terms of bioinformatics. Uh, this is more in terms of the graphical representation of the genome for publication. This is MOV. So MOV will show you the open reading frames and compare them with other open reading frames. And in MOV, you can utilize these to identify what are known as genomic rearrangements. However, when you do genome sequencing using short reads, you must be very careful when you interpret this data, as short reads can provide erroneous data. Finally, we have the RAS software or rapid annotation using subsystem technology. This is one of the most useful tools. And during the procedure, you basically upload your genome into RAST. And I will provide you with a RAST ID and password. And I will demonstrate this to you during the laboratory practical, as this cannot be demonstrated online. It involves multiple steps. And we will do a RAST tutorial. I will teach you how to create an account, upload a sequence, and compare it using the RAST system. Now, the RAST system is very useful for bioinformaticians or early learners in bioinformatics. OK, this is what a RAST output looks like, and it's a one-step output. So all you do is you follow the procedures. You obtain your raw reads from the sequencer. You do the filtering and the trimming of the adapters. You assemble the reads, and then once you have your assembled contigs, all you do is you upload them to the RAS server. So the procedure is very straightforward. And once you uh, upload them to the RAS server, you will obtain what is known as the dot plot, or you'll obtain a plot of this particular sectorial plot. You can obtain almost all plots from comparative plots to the biochemical pathways. What we are interested in RAS is the features. Okay, The feature represents a region of the genome which can be defined in terms of its functionality. Now, the RAST output basically gives you a lot of information. You can even obtain the number of coding sequences, the number of RNAs, and the number of the subsystems. Now, subsystems related to specific genetic elements or pathways which are involved in the functioning of the genome. So you will generally have a subsystem coverage in terms of what is covered and what is not covered. So if your genome is new or novel, you will see a lot of unknown features. However, if your genome is general, you will see mostly all the features have been defined. Now, this particular pie chart will give you the functions of the various genes. So we'll identify your genes based on their function. For example, if you have isolated a bacterium and if you it is a photosynthetic bacterium based on your observations in the laboratory, you will find the elements of photosynthesis or the genes associated with photosynthesis in this particular assembly. If your bacterium, for instance, has antibiotic resistance, you will also find the elements associated with antibiotic resistance in this particular assembly. Now, the beauty about RAST is that you can click on any of these elements and you can look more deeply into the genome. So we have come to the end of this particular lecture on microbial molecular biology techniques. And we will proceed with this exercise once you report back to the laboratory after the completion of the current lockdown. So you can carry out the following procedures. You can go to the RAS server. I will share the link with you. And you can 
basically create an account onto Rust. And what I will do is I will log on to my Rust server, and I will assign you a certain genome sequence. You can proceed to conducting the experiment using Rust in a step-by-step -step manner. And you can try to perform the analysis. So once you report back to the physical classroom for a face-to-face -face lecture, we will go through the procedure of Rust analysis in the bioinformatics laboratory, as there are many features which I need to discuss with you. OK, so to summarize, basically, when we commence with genome sequencing, the first procedure involves laboratory procedure, and the next procedure involves the actual sequencing, followed by the bioinformatics procedures. To begin, you should always know the objective of your experiment. Why are you sequencing the genome? Do you want to sequence the genome in order to identify new genes? Or are you interested in other features? That's the first question. Once you have under answered that question, you move on to your genome size, and you calculate the data output. You then proceed to physically culturing the bacterium in a pure form in the laboratory. You proceed to extraction of the RNA, RNA and the DNA, the purification of the DNA. And you basically move on to quality control. You then have to perform what is known as a library prep using the instructions from the manufacturer. And you proceed to sequencing. Once you obtain your sequence data, you proceed to purifying that data or basically filtering that data using a fast QC. You trim the reads using Trimomatic. And then you proceed to assembly using any software which you require based on the read length, and you proceed to annotation. Once you annotate the genome, you can compare it with other genomes, as well as look for specific genes. So this is basically what you look for when you conduct a genome sequencing experiment. So the objective of this lecture has been to introduce you to one component of microbial techniques, which is genome sequencing assembly and annotation. If you have any questions, you can post them in the forums in the Smart3 Learning Management System. I will answer them by the end of today. Thank you very much for participating in this lecture. So we have come to the end of this particular lecture on microbial molecular biology techniques. And I will upload this lecture into the platform, the learning management system, so that you can download it as the bandwidth connection is relatively low. And there may be a break in the live class. You can refer to the slides and post your questions in the forum. I will then respond to your questions in the chat window. And we will do a complete annotation and assembly once you return back to the laboratory. Thank you very much for watching, and stay safe.